This message is for moms. It's dedicated to you. I want to talk about the seasons that come in the life of your sons, your daughters, how to think about those seasons, and how can we pray for our kids as they navigate the seasons. I think you'll find that because it's the Word of God, it has a very specific application to every one of us, and and I, I have full trust that The word will speak in that way to you. But on this day, to moms, I want you to see Hebrews 11, verse 23, where by faith, Moses' parents, they hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Thanks, mom, for knowing that there's not a son or daughter in your home that's ordinary. They are extraordinary. They are the gift of God. They are the blessing of God with the destiny of God over their lives. Thank you for recognizing that. Here we see that Moses' parents, they were not afraid of the king's edict. It was Pharaoh who was thinking all of these these boys that were being born would grow up and become warriors and he and his kingdom would be overthrown. So he made the unbelievable edict to have them all murdered. But Moses' parents, they were not afraid of this edict, and they acted in a way, certainly in faith, to do what they felt God was calling them to do. If you read Exodus 2, you see where these parents are moving forward, and it's Moses' mother that saw how special he was. And in the face of this command of Pharaoh, she prepared a basket. She placed him in it into the Nile River. He ends up with Pharaoh's daughter. An amazing story that unfolds because of the faith and the sacrifice of a mom. A mom that was trusting God, not knowing what the future would hold, but trusting God. We find that it is Pharaoh's daughter that actually named Moses. It says that she named him Moses because he was drawn out. I want to show you three seasons in the life of Moses that all of us navigate as we live. This first season is that he was drawn out. He was drawn out of the stream of human history for the purposes of God. Your sons and your daughters, they are by design. God has plans for them. God has plans to draw them out unto himself in this time in human history to learn about him, to know him, to serve him, to build a worldview based on him, to establish convictions based on their relationship with him, and to follow the voice of the shepherd in their heart, in the way and in the purposes that he has. The first season is you're drawn out where it's a discovery of God, a discovery of calling, gifts, talents, convictions. That is season number one, drawn out. Now, Moses, he has three seasons. They all last 40 years. I don't uh, know that the seasons in our lives all last that long, but what the point here is that as long as you are a parent, you will be praying because your son and your daughter, they'll be in a season. So we never stop being parents. We never stop doing our part in helping them navigate the seasons. Toward the end of the first season, Moses commits the sin of murder. This initiates the second season. He ends up in Midian. It's a desert. The Bible even gets specific that he was on the backside of that desert. He is now herding sheep. This is the one drawn out to be a deliverer. He is now so far from that purpose. He is so off the plan of God. And he has his first son in that place. He names that son Gershom. And Gershom's name really defines that season. Gershom's name means I don't belong. This is Moses saying, I know how I got here. But I know I'm not supposed to be here. There's that tension of even if you're not ready to surrender to God, you still know 
that you are in a season that you don't belong. And so that's the way we see that next season defined. I'll just pause right here and want to thank every mom for not naming your sons or your daughters Gershom. <laughs> yeah. And all of us sons and daughters who aren't named Gershom said, thank you, Jesus. Hey, Gershom. Uh, let's not pause in that season. That's the season where it's awkward. There's tension. There's conviction. There still could be, I'm enjoying this, even though I know it's wrong. Or it could be, why did I do what I did to end up here? That's season number two. Here's the good news. God has not exited Moses' life. It is in that season that God shows up in his fiery presence called the burning bush. And out of his fiery presence, he puts Moses' name on a mission. As we honor graduates next weekend, from Friday night at our summit graduation through all services, I'm going to talk about how God puts your name on a mission from Exodus 3. In this third season, Moses has his second son named Eliezer, and his name means God is my helper. God has been and God is my helper. Now you see the three seasons drawn out for the purpose of God. But like Moses, often we just mess it up and we end up in a place that we don't belong. But God is not finished. Can I get an amen right there? God's not finished. And he issues an opportunity and a call so that we too can walk in a new season of realizing that God is my helper. We will see, because of who God is, the convergence of all three. Those are the three seasons, but how are we to think about those seasons? As a parent, as we watch our sons and daughters do life, how are we to think about the seasons? Here's number one. God is faithful in every season. That's how we think about it. Anybody that's lived a while, I'm 56 now, and I want to tell you, that it blesses my heart to tell you that God has never failed. He's not going to start now. And in my season where I knew I was drawn out, and in my season where I ended up in places I did not belong because choices I made, God was faithful. And God is my helper today. God has been my helper because God is faithful, faithful in every season. Praise him if you know he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Praise him if you know he's the one who was, who is, and is to come. His mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God. He's faithful in every season. So therefore, he doesn't waste the season. I would issue a challenge that as you recognize the faithfulness of God in the seasons, don't get trapped by your season. Let it shape you, but not trap you. You may be in a season that's unfolded that it's more about what's happened to you than what you've done. It's been negative, difficult, like maybe unspeakable. You find yourself at the intersection of better or bitter. You have the opportunity to go down Better Street through the help of God. If you choose that, you'll be shaped by your season. But if you go down Bitter Street, you'll be trapped by the season. And I want to tell you what empowers you to make the choice of better over bitter. It's the faithfulness of God. God was with Moses when he was drawn out, growing up in Pharaoh's home. He was with Moses in his sin, in his mistakes, in the season where he ended up where he didn't belong. God was faithful. God's faithful when I'm not. Mm. 
Would any of us be here but for the faithfulness of God? And from that faithfulness, he expresses his love. He expresses grace. He expresses a fresh call. God is faithful. That's how we think about the seasons. Instead of letting the season give definition, let God give definition. God is faithful at every level and in every season. Kelly and I are the blessed parents of Ryan and Lindsay and Connor. And we can tell you, God is faithful in every season. Do I have any parents that can say, I've seen the faithfulness of God in the seasons of my sons and my daughters. Amen. He's faithful. The second way I would encourage you to think about the seasons is that God, is, God has a strategy for every season. He does. Because he's faithful, he's not just present. He's present with a plan. He has a strategy. There are many. I just would highlight one. When we're in the seasons of life, we would rather focus by human nature on the width of our influence, the success of life. I would love to pray, God, expand my borders, increase my influence. And God is first and foremost about the depth of godly character before he is about the width of influence. With God, it's deep before wide. There's a prophecy over you. It comes from the word of God. It's the word that says, enlarge your tent, enlarge your thinking. Expansion is coming. God's got a big life for you. God has plans for you. They're not small plans. But before you enlarge the tent. You've got to lengthen the cords and strengthen the stakes. It's godly character before more power. If I get more power than I have character, I will melt down. We get examples and they're heartbreaking of when somebody has more authority than they do character. God has a strategy for the seasons, when you're drawn out and you know there's a plan, keep going deep in God. When you've messed it up and you repent, keep going deep in your walk with God. When the fire of his presence issues a clarion call and you know you're gonna do great things for God, always know it's about who I am before what I do. It's character before charisma. It's deep before wide. That's the strategy of God in the seasons. God is sovereign in every season because he's faithful, because he has a strategy. Then we get to watch the power of his sovereignty. In our own natural mind, we may say, from where I was to where I am and what I've done, I have neutralized, I have undermined, I have eliminated the plan and the purpose of God. And if I can wrap my mind around, I can be forgiven. It may be another story to wrap my mind about being useful. But in the sovereignty of God, he says, wait a minute, that's you trying to write your story. I'm the author. Mm. And the sovereign power of God just reaches in and takes the pen and begins to write the script. And this script writer, because he's sovereign, he can cause there to be a convergence of all the seasons, the good, the bad, and the ugly. All the great things he merges in to form character. All the bad things because he's sovereign, he can turn it for character, formation, and testimony that can speak volumes to somebody who needs God. This is the sovereign power of God that Moses didn't find God. No, he was on the backside of the desert 
and God found Moses. And in his sovereign power, he ignites a bush. He doesn't need that, that bush to be the fuel of that fire. It's a sovereign fire. It needs no help. So it's a fire that the bush is not consumed. So Moses will have no doubt this has become a place of the holy, sovereign presence of God. It showed up. It found him. And out of that fire, God put Moses' name, the murderer, got his name placed on a mission to go and do the work of God. The sovereignty of God is in control. Now, think about this. Because of this, we now have Moses, who through the seasons experiences the sovereign power of God. And now we have the Pentateuch, which are the first five books of the Bible. Moses wrote them. This is the guy who gave us the creation story. This is the guy who taught, taught us about covenant through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who showed us so much about God through the story of Joseph, the story of Joseph occupying more chapters than any other single person in the Old Testament. This is the guy who gave us the Ten Commandments, who led millions of people out of slavery and gave us the movie, The Prince of Egypt. <laughs> when you go back and look at this edict of Pharaoh and it looked hopeless but God, the sovereignty of God protected Moses. When Moses was raised in that home and could have gone any direction, there was in his heart a desire to honor God. He got caught up in a situation and made a horrible, sinful choice and murdered a man. But that sin was not greater than God's sovereignty. I remember going through my grandmother's home as a kid, and I was singing, he's got the whole world in his hands. I've been taught that song, and I liked it. I was singing it, and my grandmother stopped me, and she said, if he has the whole world in his hands, that means he's not nervous. He's not worried about how he's going to get you from point A to point B. Today, we sit in the presence of a sovereign God. He holds the pen to be the author of your life. He is the very author and the perfecter of your faith. Come on, somebody. He has set before you a race. You run that race with endurance. God's not finished. God is at work. God is good. God is gracious. God is sovereign. I'm talking about the recreating power of God. I'm talking about the realigning power of God. Would I be standing here today preaching to you but for the power of God that can create a clean heart, that can realign with purpose and destiny? I'm not here on the merits of my seasons. I'm here because God is strategic and sovereign and faithful in the seasons. If you know it, if you know what I'm talking about. How could we pray over these seasons as we watch our sons and daughters navigate? Let me give you the first prayer. Prayer puts my unknown future in the hands of an all-knowing God. Moses could have said, what now? He gets taken into Pharaoh's home. What now? Go to the second season. He's committed murder. What now? Sometimes as a parent, you watch your kids in a season, and you not only have, if it's a tough season, you not only struggle with the fact that they're in that season, but sometimes the greater struggle is, where does this lead? What's the future really hold? And it's in those moments that fear 
can grip your heart, your mind, your emotions. And it's in those times, because God is faithful, strategic, and sovereign, I would say, place that unknown future in the hands of an all-knowing God and say, God, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth right now in my son's life, my daughter's life. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You take hold of the promise of God over your son, over your daughter, and you don't walk by sight. You walk by faith in the word of God over your family regardless of the seasons. Here's what Paul said about Abraham. This is Romans chapter four, starting at verse 18, reading from the New Living Translation. Even when there was no reason for hope. Why? Because God said to Abraham, you're gonna be the father of many nations. He's way too old to be having kids and so is Sarah. But Abraham kept hoping. God has sent me on this Mother's Day with a word. Keep hoping. Don't give up. Amen. Believing that he would become the father of many nations for God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken. Even though in the natural, this was impossible. He's 100 years old. He said, this is him, this is Paul writing. He figured his body was as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. Just getting real. This can't happen. This is impossible. This is hopeless. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. I can see the season, but I have a promise. And I'm not gonna let the season define the future. I'm gonna let the promise of God define the future. I'm not gonna let this present season dictate my perspective and live in defeat. I'm gonna believe in the promise of God. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. I love this. He was fully convinced would you say those two words with me? One, two, three. He was that God is able to do whatever he promises. Do you believe that? That God can do whatever he promises? Do you believe it? Then place the unknown future in the hands of an all-knowing God. Give him praise today. He's out in front. He's out in front. He'll, he'll figure it out. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's not nervous. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. How do we pray? If your son, your daughter, they're in a time of brokenness, prayer allows you to put a broken life in the hands of an all-powerful God. Amen. Hallelujah. You could replace that with all-loving God or all-powerful God and all-loving God. The kind of love that would show up at the backside of a desert of a person who had made a complete mess of his life and bring forgiveness, bring grace, recreate a clean heart and realign him with purpose. He can do it for our sons and our daughters. Place that broken life in the hands of an all powerful God. I hear the Lord saying, if we have an empty tomb, then tell me what God can't do. We sang over the Easter season, it was kind of like a, a chosen theme that we wanted to get embedded in the culture of our church. The song is, what I see. Do you see what I see? That the tomb is empty. Because if you do, 
then you know anything is possible. So I'm not going to look at the season as dark and as difficult as it may be. I'm going to look at the empty tomb. And if God could put me back together and if he could put you back together and all these people that we've watched him put back together, then he can take the brokenness of your son and your daughter and he can bring his healing, redeeming virtue, his power. You're like, I, I just, Pastor, I just, I can't see it. I'm, I know it's by faith, but the sovereignty of God is still at work. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. As the worship team joins me, I, I want you to see that in the seasons, the word of the Lord to us today is keep moving. If you study Exodus, it's, it's a book about God wanting the people to keep moving forward, and it starts with Moses. Keep moving forward. Moses, the desert, that's not, that's not the end of this, this journey. Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. If you are in your teen years, God is getting you ready for your 20s. And if you're in your 20s, God is getting you ready for your 30s. You got to keep moving forward. And therefore, the choices you make, align them with God. If you say, I messed it up, then ask him to forgive you and write the script of the plan of your life. If you're in your 30s, God is, God's getting you ready for your 40s. If you're in your 50s, you are, I, I just want to testify, you're not over the hill. <laughs> are you clapping? I can't hear if you're clapping. <laughs> God's getting us ready for our 60s. If you're in your 60s, God's getting you ready for your 70s. Yeah. If you're in your, come on, better at 70. If you're in your 70s, God is getting you ready for your 80s. If you're in your 80s, God is getting you ready for your 90s. And if you're in your 90s, uh, God's getting you ready for a season that will never end where the lamb is the light and you'll see Jesus face to face and there won't be any more crying and there won't be any more death and there won't be any more sickness for God himself will wipe, every, come on somebody, he'll wipe every tear from your eyes. Just keep moving forward. Come on church, we're not gonna be stuck. We're not gonna be trapped. We're gonna keep, come on, we're gonna keep moving forward. The devil wants you to stop. The devil wants you to just be stuck. We're gonna keep moving forward. Come on, God is faithful in every season. God has a strategy for every season. God is sovereign in every season. Give him a shout of praise. He's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Now, with your eyes closed, we're allowing faith to be released in this room your heart may be breaking and yet we're, we're allowing faith to go to work if you would say pastor I'm in a season and it's not good and I, and I need to bring surrender to God I'm going to give an altar call and I want you to come if you say I'm in a season and I am dreaming God is, God is unfolding dreams in my heart and I so want to honor him and to live up to the calling on my life like it's never been better and the dream's getting bigger and I want to keep moving forward. I want you to come. I want to give this altar call. If you have a son or a daughter that's in a season and they're struggling and you feel a threat at times of fear, I want you to come to the altar today and give that unknown future over into the hands of an all-knowing God who's good, who never fails. He's not going to stop now. I want you to come and just exercise your faith. I have a word here, Elijah. He was told about a season where it would not rain, and it didn't, but then he was told there now it's a new season, it's about to rain. He said, tell everybody to get ready, but it was a blue sky day. 
he told the guy with him, he said, you go up to the top of the mountain. You look out over the horizon and you come back and tell me if you see a cloud. People are coming to the altar. It's beautiful. It's powerful. That guy would come back to Elijah and say, there's not a cloud in the sky. And the Bible says, and Elijah prayed. He prayed because he had a promise from God. He prayed. He bare, he bore down in prayer, the Bible says. And on the seventh time, that man came back and says, way out in the distance, I see a cloud. At that point, it was very small, like the size of a man's hand. And right then, Elijah said, it's a new season. You better tell everybody to get ready because the rain is about to fall. Elijah prayed and put it in the hands of an all-powerful God. And that miracle was in the making and it came into their reality. Who needs a miracle today? Would you come to the altar right now? So you're talking to me. Come on, we're, gonna, we're, we're about to seek God on this Mother's Day. And we're going to ask God for miracles. We're going to ask God for divine intervention. We're going to ask God for faith and perseverance and peace and power. That's it. Just come. You know who you are. Say, I got to get to that altar today. This is for me. This is for me. You come. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to declare the faithfulness of God through this song. And as they sing it, you know who you are and how God's leading. Come to the altar and we will pray together.